PM challenges opposition to a live TV debate. Rural Health Center receives ambulance after 25 years. And Simbu Warriors makes a comeback bid for Intercity Cup. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for National MTV News. Prime Minister James Marape says the Wutong plan, as alluded to by the opposition, is a recipe for a return to the bad old days when foreign corporations and interests dominated and controlled the PNG economy and politics. Mr. Marape issued this statement in response to Alata MP Charles Abel's recent spat on the opposition's media conference this week. The Prime Minister said there was much misinformation and hot air from the Crown, and he challenged them to a live television debate. Is an Prime Minister James Marape has called out on the opposition for what he termed is selling out the country's interest for the good of investors in the corporate world. In a media statement, the Prime Minister said that for the first time since independence, his government had stood up to foreign interests and influence and acted as an independent nation that decides its own future. He said the Wutong plan was an opposition fantasy and would plunge the country back into the dark days when ordinary Papua New Guineans could only look on helplessly as the world from natural resources found its way into overseas corporate pockets and into the overseas bank accounts of their cronies. On Tuesday, the member for Alatau during a media conference outlined the Wutong plan, stating a quick turnaround in resource sectors. Negotiations would allow such projects like Pogara Mine, Wafi Golpu and Papua LNG to progress at a faster pace than how it was currently being handled under the Marape government. We have been spending time on a document called the Wutong Call to Action. We have tried to translate uh, some of the concerns we have into concrete actions and measures that we can realistically undertake in 12 months to try and stabilize what is happening to our country uh, politically, but also stop some of the deterioration in, in governance systems that many of the good leaders have already described. The Alatau MP responded on social media regarding the TV debate, stating that the debate should take place in Parliament since Parliament has not set for the required sitting days. Today, the Prime Minister challenged the opposition to a live debate to assess his performance over the 18 months he has governed the country. MTV's attempt to get comments from the Prime Minister during a public engagement today regarding his intentions for a live TV debate with members of the opposition on issues affecting the country were unsuccessful as he says he was unprepared for an audience with the media. Anet Cora, National MTV News. Opposition leader Belden Nama issued a statement late this afternoon accepting the challenge for a live national TV debate. He said the Crown team will prefer to show the nation the actions they will take, the economic development that can be measured and policies that will benefit Papua New Guineans in real time. He urged the Prime Minister to mark this date, December 4, 2020, and 18 months from now, just before the 2022 elections, so the nation can see the difference between his 18 months in office and our, meaning the opposition's 18 months in office. But if the Prime Minister is keen to do so, Nama said the debate should take place on the floor of Parliament and broadcast live on national television and live streamed for people to follow. Minister assisting the Prime Minister on sports, Wesley Raminai, has recounted how he was kept from moving around during the two weeks in Vanimo. He said they were under close watch and could not perform their electoral duties. He revealed this yesterday after a trip to his electorate. Raminai, who moved out of Crown Hotel early this week to join the government, was rewarded with a ministry. In the opposition camp, I wouldn't, I didn't go out. Uh, I wasn't given that freedom. Uh, as uh, many of the leaders, we should be given that uh, uh, freedom to go out. Uh, but we're not given that choice. I was uh, able to have that freedom to move around. And the first thing I did, the first day after I was uh, sworn in, I had to go straight to my district and uh, continue on on the work that I'm supposed to do as a mandated leader.
with my uh, yeah, as a mandatory leader. The Samburigi Rural Health Centre in Southern Highlands Province finally has an ambulance they can call their own after 25 years of hosting the Gobe oil fields. With the Gobe oil wells running dry by the day, this help is just one of many services in this community's wish list. This ambulance, alike, unlike its sisters in the cities and towns, will travel the rough terrains, the unsealed limestone roads in the middle of thick tropical rainforest with no human inhabitants, travelling seven to eight hours to reach the nearest hospital in Mendi. Samburigi is located in the border of Southern Islands and Gulf provinces and used to be accessible by air back in the days, but that airstrip has since been closed. Today they either walk hours over mountains to get to the nearest road to Erave, the district capital, or pay high fares to travel the rough roads through Gulf province into the Kutubu area and onto Mendi to access basic services. But it has produced some of the top elites of Southern Highlands, including the managing director of MRDC, Augustin Mano. And Mr. Mano is now on a mission to use the money derived from their oil field in Gobe to bring about much needed services to this long forgotten community. As a first step to this ambitious vision, MRDC, through its community infrastructure program, took delivery of an ambulance to serve the 20,000 plus people of Samberegi village. The Sambareki Health Centre is run by the Evangelical Church of Papua and its health secretary was grateful for this donation. The ambulance here before us is a timely gift. Thank you from the team that is coming from. This is the beginning that we want to send a patient before. All the time, when they go on the radio, we chatter a plane to go to Mindy or Hagen. And pass. Sorry. But now we we'll all go back to Kikori. Among these other concerns were the need to build a maternity ward at this health centre. And the officer in charge of the health centre, Gloria Peter, supported this call and gave an account of what she goes through to deliver mothers. No privacy for mama. Mama feeling pain. Mama like carrying baby. Blue dick outside. Everybody becomes a doctor and nurses to see that mother. No privacy at all. She urged the community to look after this vehicle and even warn them of the consequences if the vehicle is damaged. Managing Director of MRDC, Augustin Mano, told the people of how the oil fields were slowly running dry and the importance of working together like there was no oil in this valley. Go where you must have a hammer's oil and produce him now. First production was 30,000 barrels a day, you know, peak 30,000. Now Gobi only produced 300 barrels a day, all of Gobi, 300 barrels a day. With four years remaining before Mano leaves MRDC, he assured these people of his continued support. He also warned them to look after this ambulance, as this will determine other projects to this area in the future. Time you develop a car or one of them, how you maintain him, how you work about how you look at them will decide what will happen with also you block them because locar all this la one and one and because it's a test of how you can look at them all this or something yeah. Meantime, MRDC through Petroleum Resource Gobe will also help to pay the salaries of the driver. Ruth Rongola, National MTV News. COVID-19 effects on businesses is still being felt across the board despite the government's announcement of a 10 million kina one-off assistance to support struggling SMEs. Today, Finance Minister and Caretaker Minister for National Planning announced the government's assistance for trucking business. Rainbow Paita said the support was long overdue and was the government's recognition for their contributions to the economy. He cited the closure of Pogera Mine as a reason for the government's backing. The 10 million kina funding given to SME trucking businesses will come from the special intervention program under the national budget. Special funding of about 10 million here yeah, that we will present to, Secretary will present, um, Secretary will present on behalf of the government and the department under the program of special intervention. There is a program that very uh, important program we have. Um, in the department and that is to ensure that when we have circumstances like this we can intervene. 
Most trucking companies are stationed in Leh and service the Highlands Highway. Apart from COVID-19, the trucking industry has seen a loss in generating income following the closure of Pogara Mine in Enga province after negotiations went sour with the state. Clearly for this industry that we are trying to assist now has been sort of a double impact given that SME at the same time the issue on uh, uh, Pogara issue when it came to a closure awaiting the outcome of uh, our position as government uh, in trying to deal with the SML. They took a double hit and initially um, the previous uh, minister and prime minister had some discussions with uh, these operators and I was privy to that meeting which took place at Airways and a commitment was made to the operators that government would assist through some special intervention program to assist them uh, while we were uh, having a closure on the outcome of Pogara issue. Meanwhile, the 10 million kina will be managed through PNG Trucking Association on behalf of its members. The association will administer the disbursement and reporting through an agreed approach in consultation with the Department of National Planning and Monitoring. They not put us back to where we want to be, but we appreciate the fact that there's a lot of other people that are suffering the very much pain that we are going through. But I think we've got to speak for ourselves because we are responsible for the ones that we employ uh, and the institutions that finance us, that we've got to have some answers. It's not a great feeling for us to get support from the government. We want to work for it and earn it ourselves. Because how long can we go on doing this? We are better off giving it to those areas that need us all the most rather than for us to be sitting here thinking that government is going to fix our problems. On that note, we, we feel bad when others are suffering for us to receive a check, but as I've said, we, we've got to look after the industry. Adelaide Strokes, Curry, National, MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Komol Training Institute has become the second institution in PNG to be certified by the PNG Civil Aviation and Safety Authority to train aircraft engineers. It received its certification today and is now ready to train PNG students wishing to pursue a career in aircraft engineering. Kumul Institute is venturing into a highly technical field and received much praise from Casa PNG for taking a bold step to invest in this training. Kumul Training Institute has passed the five different phases of the process involved in certification and after three years of hard work, finally received its certificate today from Casa PNG. Casa PNG in presenting this certificate said, the aviation sector was a highly regulated sector and technical skills imparted to students in this sector must be of high quality. This occasion we want to mark the issuing of the Civil Aviation Rules Part 141, Aviation Training Organization Certificate to uh, Kumo yeah. Training Institute for training of aircraft maintenance engineers in Papua New Guinea. This is a major step and a major event in the, uh, in the aviation calendar, in the civil aviation uh, system in Papua New Guinea that a, a national company headed up by uh, PNG citizens is undertaking this task. He added it was good to see homegrown institutions like Kumul stepping up to the challenge. Managing director of Kumul, Max Curry, was a relieved man, working tirelessly over three years to qualify for this day. We look forward to enroll our students next year and onwards, and we will uh, train students in the uh, aviation industry, in uh, aircraft maintenance and other uh, related programs, and we'll certify them as a certificate level to diploma level. Without the assistance of the Casa PNC, we wouldn't come this far. Thank you for assisting us. Uh, His encouragement to Papua New Guineans was that in today's digital world, nothing was hard. It takes one to take that first step. CEO of Casa PNG, Wilson Sagatin, congratulating Kumul Training Institute, also reminded them of their responsibility to maintain compliance. Of course, the certificate doesn't just come uh, with a piece of paper, it comes with awesome responsibilities under the Civil Aviation Act. Yes. And, 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 and so, uh, as the regulator, we will continue to monitor your compliance and ensure that 
you meet the requirements of the Act so that the, the students that come to your college are trained and are passed out with quality. They're quality students that come from your college. And Mr. Curry is ready to put money into this new training program and promised CASA PNG of compliance. Ruth Rungula, National MTV News. Over 200 settlers residing at Lay State House since 2016 have called on the Morbe provincial government to resettle them. A spokesperson said settlers have faced issues with overcrowding, no access to water supply and electricity over the years. Since 2016, there have been over 10 deaths and 12 babies born in the settlement. The Morabe Provincial Government State Houses served as the care centre for over 200 displaced settlers for five years now. They were displaced from their home at the Boundary Road suburb following an ethnic clash in 2016. Since then, 12 babies have been born here and over 10 have passed on. Settlers say even after five years, they still long to move back to their original homes. Firewood problem, high care problem, or picking in a study good, or in a silly good, Mifla will get in a silly good, now Mifla will go find him out through. Now Mifla, let's finish the establo yan. Now one time by Mifla, move lo yan, I go back and lo ablo Mifla. According to a spokesperson, Uga Munelli, they were placed at the state house in 2016 under the directive of then Governor Kelly Naru. Nelly said this arrangement was supposed to be temporary while the provincial administration arranged for their resettlement. The settlers signed an MOU with the MPG in 2017 for their resettlement. However, Nelly claims only nine families were resettled under that agreement. Now yet this law nine plus all Lucy Mipla Nigo all stab yet. Now me plus strong now me plus stab lo here. Me plus strong now stab yet lo here. Now all being got some plus attempt lo kissim police lo come na evict me plus lo here. That's how me plus been go looking court long fighting rights me plus kissim court order lo restrain him all lo all lo can come lo district court me plus kissim. The settlers have since taken the matter to court on the grounds of human rights over a long way to be resettled. People from Morobe, this area, I have no right to establish here, I have no respect. You have no respect for this area, an area where the government will not stop. I have no right to stop, but I have still wait long. One time, the government will not stop and resettle me back. I have no right to stop, I have no right to stop. Long strong people, me play it. Go see him. Seek him justice. Now, me play that lawyer now. Lawyer, lawyer, lawyer by lawyer. Blah blah blah. Fighting this case now. All up area blah fast tricking this law. Meanwhile, an attempt to get an update from the Morobe Provincial Administration on resettlement plans for these settlers was unsuccessful. Shalin Airy, National MTV News, Lay. One may not believe that watermelons could grow in warm and cold climates. The Juwaka people from a village in Pepic along the Highlands Highway can attest to that. Watermelon farmers yesterday ended their three-day retail business training so that they could put to good use their income. This is Dixon Tuap. He started planting watermelon not long ago, but he has already built a permanent house worth 40,000 kina. Dixon attended a retail training to help him budget his money and put into good use. Plan one, let me get number one, it's like two, three thousand, number one thousand. I'm planning ten, I'm planning ten, two thousand, I'm planning six thousand, one thousand, six thousand, it's a big use law. I would not see them if I want to see them, but if I give me money, I would not see them now and make them be working big flowers low, backside there. Another woman, Puri Gabriel, was the first to plant watermelon in 1986 at Pepic when she first settled there. Puri and her son also built their permanent house with the money they earned from selling watermelon on the roadside or sold in bulk to supermarkets in Mount Hagen. Seeing the income from selling watermelon, Puri was reluctant to share her knowledge but had recently decided to teach interest.
interested local farmers who now grow watermelon. So maniblo watermelon and we ne mo gata maniblo na lo cash crops me blo sa plan. Names I give good plan kam lo me blo so nowadays me blo plan me stop na me blo nothing him ka go or na blo some no because me blo no extra kind money also watermelon. Earning money can be a success story. However, saving it and putting it into good use can be a problem many farmers are going through. Next year, I'm meeting on the plan of new plants also. So save my up now. But the money good now. This like any minus away. Minus I'm giving so now. This like school I'm come now. I'm helping me good long. How we can budget the money for me long thing him next year now. According to Bank of Papua New Guinea, 85% of PNG's population have no bank account. Seeing the need, market for village farmers through BPNG's Center for Excellence in Financial Inclusion, Fresh Produce Development Agency and its partners are training local farmers' the savings culture to eliminate financial exclusion and to eradicate poverty in PNG. We will open the accounts. Uh, we will encourage them to save uh, something for tomorrow uh, to build a saving culture in our community. And also there will be a credit facility available. Uh, we call it seed money and that is uh, farmers will access. A 85 million kina was made available by the International Funding for Agriculture Development and arm of the United Nations to support agriculture. This is to improve market access for farmers by facilitating the transition from semi-subsistence to agro-farming businesses. The agencies will continue to conduct financial literacy training and ensure that farmers achieve their goals. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Commodity boards under the Department of Agriculture and Livestock will now have access to the 50 million kina that is allocated for the price support program. This follows the signing of a memorandum of understanding by heads of respective boards this week at the central government office. The signing follows the presentation of a 50 million kina program recently, which is aimed at assisting small-scale farmers. Each of the commodities has been given a specific amount of funding based on the revenue they generate in foreign exchange and the volume of production of respective commodities. Department of Agriculture and Livestock Secretary Daniel Kombuk said this program was made possible by the foresight and vision of wise leaders who have seen how agriculture could boost and turn the economy of this country around. We have dismissed a total of uh, uh, 40, 48 million to all these commodity boards. Uh, basically, uh, the government's target now is to reach out to small farmers over there. Secretary Kombuk said the funds will go towards supporting or subsidizing prices of commodities, including cocoa, coffee, and copra. Uh, very, very important for as an exciting time. It's like a Christmas present to all our, our hard-working farmers right across Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And this is from the Marabin government. He said this is the first of its kind for such program to be rolled out. The price support rollout program will be run as an independent program with a management unit that will oversee the operations of this program. Uh, my offices in my uh, department will go out so work very, very closely with the community board to see uh, who is doing what in the field, like... Uh, um, coffee cherry buyers and also the green, wet bean buyers in the cocoa industry will be identified and the, the funds will be disbursed to them through the various commodity boards uh, and they were close, uh, close uh, 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 words. Timely reports and audits will be carried out to ensure that the funds are used accordingly. The commodity boards have all signed the MOUs and are now preparing to roll out the program. Shamin Poreambeb, National MTV News. And now looking at the NASFUND market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, Yokina is buying 0.2775 US dollars, 0.3686 Australian dollars, 0.2202 Euro and 28.15 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher, coffee, cocoa and palm oil closed higher, crude oil is trading lower. 
And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 85.03 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 18.66 points higher. And the All Ordinaries is trading at 18.88 points lower, higher. And National MTV News returns with more after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Marbe's provincial administrator Bart Impambonj says he has not cited any petition by Marbe women requesting the reopening of the Manolos Aviation Access Gate or the removal of the Marbe business arm CEO Elizabeth Bradshaw. The petition was addressed to the governor Ginsen Saunu and provincial authorities following the welding of the helicopter company's access gate, disrupting Medivac operations. On Wednesday, these women waited outside the Morabe Sustainable Investments Office gate, waiting to be addressed by the provincial administrator. Inside, a closed-door board meeting was taking place. The women's concerns sparked from the welding of the Manolos Aviation's access gate by the Morabe business arm, disrupting medivacs. We plan like him respond blow PA area or suppose them to plan governor talk talk. PA must talk seven lo me plan area plan now. In response to MTV regarding the gate closure, CEO of the Marble Provincial Government's business arms Elizabeth Bradshaw said they had a court order to close the gate. The women petitioned against the closure of the access gate, saying it disrupted a vital service for Morabe's rural population and demanded that the company show the court order and also remove or force Bradshaw to resign. On Wednesday, Provincial Administrator Bart Ipambonj responded to the media regarding okay, this petition. Uh, get it here. I have not cited the petition. Well, who was that petition addressed to? And if it was addressed to me, I haven't cited it and I can't respond to it yet. But if, if it was given to uh, uh, our, our leaders, I think that's a matter for them to uh, respond to it. When asked if there was a court order warranting the closure of the gate, MPG Business Arms Legal Counsel Ralph Saulab said it was a matter before the courts and could not comment further. Uh, whether uh, there is an order, whether they disobeyed uh, or what happened to it, I think that's a matter that lawyers will argue in court, so we, we can just leave it there. Saulep also said the management has resolved to keep the access gate open while court proceedings between the two parties continue. Uh, Manolos is free to uh, carry on its operations uh, as it sees uh, fit. So long as there is mutual respect that they do not abuse the property of the business arms. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lee. And turning overseas, a stern warning. This next story contains disturbing content about sexual abuse. A man has revealed that he was raped and assaulted on a weekly basis over a two-year period by a Marist brother at a Catholic church in Christchurch. The attacks occurred in the early 80s. Marist Aldis, who knew of the allegations earlier, hadn't stopped him from being around children. Out of the shadows with a secret he's held for 40 years. James is 52 years old. As a 12-year-old, he was subjected to horrific attacks by this man, Brother Giles, a.k.a. Kevin Waters, the principal of Christchurch's Xavier Intermediate. I not only was sexually abused, I was mentally abused, and I was also caned by him as well. Brother Giles singled James out, took him to his office at the school, and showed him a pornographic magazine. The grooming quickly progressed. Over months it'll change, you know, to... Uh, you know, me having to leave my pants at the door basically and coming in and you know uh, basically performing the the acts that he wanted for two years at the school james was raped every week sometimes twice a day 
So every, every day I was in fear. I would arrive for, at school Monday morning and I would be shaking and, and you know, just trembling basically at knowing what could be happening. Sometimes I'd, I'd uh, wee myself, you know, and of course uh, I was known in the class as the, as the kid that pissed himself basically, you know. That was out of pure fear. It was, yeah. James told his deeply religious father what had happened, but he wasn't believed. He told me that a man of the cloth wouldn't do that and that uh, I was never to talk about it again. Last year, James made a formal complaint. He then discovered the Maris brothers had knowledge of multiple abuse complaints about Brother Giles dating back to the 1950s. He should have never been allowed around children, you know, with that history. And they knew about it, they did nothing about it. How do you feel about the total lack of action? To be honest, I'm absolutely gutted. Compounding the trauma, the Maris brothers hired an investigator to look into James's case, but then refused to share the findings. He eventually got the report under the Privacy Act, but key information, like the number of Giles's victims, was redacted. The information that I wanted is, is completely covered up. The Christchurch Cathedral of Blessed Sacrament is another location where James, as an altar boy, was abused. He tried to get information from the top and approached Christchurch Bishop Paul Martin. I wanted to know if there were other boys that were raped in the cathedral, if there was any other history. But that history wasn't forthcoming. Brother Giles died in 2011. A tribute from his peers spoke of a warm-hearted community man who loves sport. And who is the true Brother Giles? A monster, an absolutely horrible monster. James knows there are many victims from many schools and has a message for those who have remained silent. If you've been abused, stand up and say something. News Hub sought comment from Maris Brothers delegate Peter Haride. He did not respond. We also emailed questions to the Christchurch Bishop. A spokesperson for the Catholic Church says they are unable to comment until they are called to give evidence at the Royal Commission. And Chuka Sports is next. Kilawani joins us at the sports desk. Thank you, Helen. Simba Warriors bid to come back in the Intercity Cup and Track and Field National Championships gets underway. Join me for the details in Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. To Rugby League, Simbu Provincial Team, the Simbu Warriors, have presented their bid to participate in the Digicel Cup 2021. The bid comes after securing a sponsor in Wagi Food Processes Limited and the backing of the Simbu Governor, Michael Dua. The club has participated, or pardon, the club last participated in 2018 in the PNG NRL competition. The Simbu Warriors today presented their bid to the Papua New Guinea National Rugby League competition in their pursuit to re-enter the Digital Cup 2021. It's a requirement also. Uh, we might be having a lot of teams coming in from various provinces, but... Uh... The club has been missing out on the national scene since 2018 due to lack of sponsorship. With Wagi Food Processes Limited coming on board as the naming rights of the club, franchise manager Tene Korokoi says it is an opportunity to find more olums in the province. I think it's about uh, time you know, we give them the opportunity to actually uh, showcase the raw talents that are hanging around in the, you know, the fringes of uh, uh, Simple Province. We have a lot of young talents, raw talents out there that needs to be exposed. But uh, since there is no team there that can actually do that, uh, we would like to uh, take that opportunity to provide uh, uh, the young people the opportunity, opportunity to showcase their talents and then uh, develop from there. You never know, there may be some hundred to thousands of uh, Justin Olam out there that needs to be, need to be showcased. In presenting the bid, the Simbu province governor backing the sentiment of the franchise manager, saying this is a pathway for raw talent exposure. We have a lot of uh, talented players out there in the, you know, in the wilderness that we have to brought them in and tame them and make them become you know, somebody professional. 
currently we have just no I mean the NRA competition. The simple provincial government is at the back too. And I'm also lobbying for my local MPs to support too. The bid was well received by Toxinema on behalf of the PNG NRLC. Your board is the first one to answer the call for the, the expression, of, expression of interest for next year's uh, Digital Cup competition. Thank you very much for uh, coming with the team, showing your support for your province. Thank you. Thank you. And Papua New Guinea's Paralympic athletes have received an important boost to their preparations towards the Tokyo Games. They received a donation of two newly constructed throwing chairs from civil contractor Curtin Brothers PNG. Five athletes are currently training for the Paralympic Games, among them Moria Mararos for seated javelin and Nelly Ruth Lever for javelin have currently qualified while the rest are yet to achieve specific qualifying standards. The athletes were also part of a week-long training camp which featured local and international facilitators on making presentations on qualification standards, anti-doping nutrition among others. The John Guy Stadium in Port Mosby will play host to the National Track and Field Championships. The competition commences today and will conclude on Sunday, the 6th of December. A total of 360 athletes from 11 centers around PNG made their way to take part in the PNG Air National Track and Field Athletics Championships at the Sejongai Stadium in Port Mosby. Teams came early to the venue to prepare for day one of competition with an array of colors outside and inside the stadium complex. Teams are looking forward to the three-day meet from the 4th to the 6th and it is exciting times for athletics in PNG. The Kengo Wana, captain of Lay Leatherbacks, says that they are looking forward to take part in the course of the weekend. Come here to beat the past records we've set, the Momase Highlands and the Moraba Games, that we won the Moraba Games, so we came here to beat that again, to give our best and our new personal best. Without the official opening, day one of the PNG Air National Track and Field Championships commenced today as the junior athletes took center stage with the under 18 and the open men's 800 meters today, with the 400 meters, 5,000 meters and 10,000 following in the afternoon for the men's and women's divisions. The 100 meters, 200 meters and other races commence tomorrow with the field events also to start tomorrow as well. Haxi Lovai, Chukai Sports. New Zealand Warrior confirmed they will be based in Australia to prepare for the next season. That story when we come back. Chukai Sports. Welcome back. The New Zealand Warriors have confirmed they will be based in Australia until at least April to prepare for the upcoming NRL season. The squad will reunite in Tamworth in early January to begin pre-season training. The Warriors have fond memories of Tamworth. And today the club announced they'll return there and start their season across the ditch once again. It was decided and announced today to the playing group that we will be relocating to Australia on the 3rd of January. They'll remain in Tamworth until the 5th of April before moving to their central coast base in February. Putting certainty into a very uncertain time, which is crucial for Brownie in his preparation uh, for the 2021 seasons. And after a roller coaster 2020, certainty is worth its weight in gold, especially to families. Part of the time frames for um, uh, this first period of commitment in Australia is uh, based around the school term in Australia, which will give uh, families the opportunity to feed their kids into school. Should the borders open before April, the Warriors won't return home straight away but target round five against Manly to finally be able to reopen the Mount Smart gates for a long-awaited homecoming on April 9th and it's certainly a date the Warriors have set in their sights. Uh, we want it sold out, we want it ready to go. The club will reassess in March but for now Nathan Brown's side can start planning for kickoff, and he's sure this is the best option they have available. There's plenty of sporting teams around the world that you know, they're going six week camps you know, to, to get their season started so we all living together is probably a bonus for us. After the trials of 2020, any bonus for the Warriors is worth celebrating. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports. Helen will be back with the weather report. Enjoy your weekend in sports. Good night. Trukai Sports.
Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for this afternoon and tonight in the southern region. Fine, partly cloudy with evening thundery showers in Port Moresby. Partly cloudy with a few showers in Daru, thundery showers in Kerama, a few showers in Alotau and mostly fine weather, although partly cloudy with a few evening showers in Popandita. In the Mamasa region, mostly fine weather, although partly cloudy with evening showers in Lei, Medang and Vanimo, mostly fine weather, although partly cloudy in Wewak. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine, though partly cloudy in Loringa, a few rain showers and thunder in Kaviang, partly cloudy with evening thundery showers in Kokopo and Rabaul, and rain showers and thunderstorms easing in Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, mostly fine, though partly cloudy with rain drizzles in Mount Hagen, and mostly fine, though partly cloudy with evening rain drizzles in Goroka, Kondiawa, Mendi and Wavek. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's been the news, sports and weather for today, Friday, 4th of December 2020. On behalf of the entire news team and I, have a great weekend ahead. Bye for now.